it's my pleasure to introduce our next plenary speaker for today, Dr. Victoria Lorimer, who comes to us all the way from Perth, Australia. Um, Dr. Lorimer did her uh, PhD in Oxford with under Alistair McGrath, and she now uh, works as a senior research fellow at the University of Notre Dame. So unlike uh, Rob yesterday, who had known Donna Strickland for 26 years, I've known Victoria for less than 24 hours, but we do have a fair bit in common, I've discovered. Uh, Victoria is active in the Australian equivalent of the Science uh, Faith Organization, and um, she has many research interests, of which you can uh, read in your program. But one of her newer research interests that's not written down is her collaboration with her three-year-old on constructing Lego. <laughs> She's becoming quite an expert, apparently. But she won't be talking to us today about that. She will be talking about her PhD research on uh, human technological enhancement and theological anthropology, and wrote a book under the same name, which was a revision of her dissertation. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Mer. Thank you. Uh, to be clear, my three-year-old is definitely the senior partner in that collaboration. <laughs> I've really enjoyed my time here so far, especially coming from Australian winter. It's really lovely to enjoy the sunshine. I wonder if you're familiar with what this date represents. Rhetorical question. <laughs> this is the predicted date that Ray Kurzweil, Google engineer and inventor, gives for what is known as the singularity. And I'm indebted to Joanna for explaining to us yesterday what that event is. Uh, and if you remember the dates that Joanna put up, you can see that uh, Kurzweil's pretty ambitious in his timing of, of when he thinks the singularity might come about. So what are we talking about? Well, in Kurzweil's own words, the singularity is, in a, is a future period during which the pace of technological change will be so rapid, its impact so deep, that human life will be irreversibly transformed. And elsewhere, he gets into some of the implications he sees, saying that we're going to get more neocortex, we're going to be funnier, we're going to be better at music, we're going to be sexier, we're going to really exemplify all the things that we value in humans to a greater degree. Of course, not all visions of the singularity are so optimistic. Many others see this event as the moment in time where AI will free itself from human control and in all likelihood destroy inferior humanity in a bid for world domination. So you choose which scenario you think is more likely. But Kurzweil is one of the main proponents of a movement called transhumanism, which is what I'll be talking to you about today. So I'm going to begin with an overview of what transhumanism is, some of the various visions that transhumanists have for the, the types of futures that we might experience. Uh, then I'll turn to a theological perspective, so some reflections on how we understand human being and how we think about the human future in conversation with some of these visions that transhumanists hold um, and kind of more technological versions of, of what humans might become. So, what is transhumanism? Well, there's lots of definitions floating around, but one that I find really helpful comes from theologian Elaine Graham. She describes transhumanism as a futuristic philosophy which celebrates the potential of advanced technologies to augment human functioning to unprecedented degrees, ushering in a new phase of post-human evolution. And support for technological enhancement really ranges across a whole spectrum. So it's helpful to think of transhumanism as sitting at the real pointy end of sort of extreme advocacy and enthusiasm for using technology to enhance human capacities. And many of the transhumanist proposals that I'm about to go through will probably strike you as being more like science fiction than, re than reality, and I acknowledge that. Uh, but nevertheless, they do inspire real-world imaginings of what kinds of futures we might be looking at. Uh, and I think because of that, they're important to engage from a perspective of faith and think theologically about that. So what kinds of enhancements are we talking about? 
Well, some researchers are looking into the biological causes of aging and attempting to halt or even to reverse them. So Cambridge researcher Aubrey de Grey speaks of engineering what he calls negligible senescence and reaching another term of his longevity escape velocity. So essentially, he just wants to stay ahead of the, the advancing technological curve and live just long enough to live forever. More extreme, we have the possibility of mind uploading, which is also called whole brain emulation. Hans Moravec, uh, who helped develop advanced robotics for both NASA and the military, popularized the idea of living perpetually through a digital substrate. So in 1988, he wrote a book called Mind Children, in which he envisioned a procedure where the entirety of the information that's encoded within the neurons of a brain could be read, scanned, copied, and then uploaded to a computer. So rather than this kind of radical extension of biological life, uh, which is kind of romanticized in all the historical immortality myths that we have, um, this is an approach that is also seeking immortality, but through software existence. And apart from increased longevity, mind uploading also pursues this goal of greater intelligence through escaping the, the limitations of a degenerating biological brain. So personal identity and memories can be backed up and the brain might benefit from running on a more uh, efficient compiler. Then we have mood enhancement. And when I read about this, I can't help but think of Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? So this is the novel that the movie Blade Runner was based off. Uh, and there's this delightful vignette in the book that, that doesn't come through into the film, uh, which features what's called a Penfield mood organ. And it's this contraption that sort of let, lets you dial into really specific moods. So one of the ones described is an awareness of the manifold possibilities open to me in the future. And the protagonist of, of the book, Rick Deckard, is having this argument with his wife over her deliberate programming of despair using the uh, device. But transhumanists also argue for mood enhancement. So David Pierce advocates for what he terms hedonic recalibration. He argues that pain and suffering can be entirely removed from our experience through pharmaceutical and genetic interventions, uh, promoting this abolitionist project that seeks the annihilation of pain in all sentient life, beginning with humans. Uh, and then still others would identify morality as a target for human enhancement. And moral enhancement, I think, can be pretty tricky to, de to define. So Harris Weissman describes it as some technological or pharmacological means of affecting the biological aspects of moral functioning to enhance, uh, to boost what is desirable or to remove what is problematic. Uh, it's really aimed at the psychological and the affective functioning of people, so it has quite a lot in common with the mood enhancement proposals. Ingmar Persson and Julian Savalescu are two other sort of self-identified transhumanists who call for the use of biomedical means of moral enhancement, focusing especially on the development and the application of psychopharmaceuticals for this end. And as traditional approaches to moral education have only had limited success in their view, they argue that global environmental catastrophe can only be avoided through biomedical means of moral enhancement. So how do we begin to engage these technological proposals from the perspective of a Christian faith? Well, I want to suggest that we take as a starting point the idea that transhumanism is a religious narrative. And what I mean by this is that transhumanism makes some claims about meaning and purpose and what it means to be human that go beyond a scientific perspective. And we can therefore think about those claims within a religious framework. And if we take a broad view, there are actually some points on which the transhumanist worldview is not entirely dissimilar to a Christian perspective. Both acknowledge that our current experience is not all it ought to be, or all that we want it to be. There's this disjuncture that we might term the human condition. Both hope in some way to transcend the limits of our frailty and finitude to live forever. And both dream of that immortal life as one that's marked by an absence of suffering and pain, 
a conquering of these negative dimensions of human experience. And Beth Fingler makes this point in an article in Eon magazine. She examines how transhumanist discourse is replete with religious symbols. So there's references to angels, to transcendence, to divinity. This is language that we're not necessarily used to encountering outside of traditionally religious con uh, contexts. And Robert Jeresey goes into even more detail over the parallels between transhumanist rhetoric and religious apocalypticism. So he talks about apocalyptic AI as a technological faith that directly borrows its sacred worldview from apocalyptic Judaism and Christianity. So like these, it refers to a dualistic view of the world, which is aggravated by a sense of alienation that can be resolved only through the establishment of a radically transcendent new world that abolishes the dualism and requires radically purified bodies for its inhabitants. The apocalyptic worldview has deeply penetrated the technological worldview of modern life. And theologian Ron Colturner makes a similar point by comparing popular evangelical visions of eschatology, so the end times, the kind of future we're headed towards, with the technological singularity. So understanding transhumanism in a religious register firstly provides Christians with an opportunity, I think. It allows us to be part of a genuine dialogue, particularly if we don't write ourselves out of the conversation from the outset by declaring all enhancements to be off limits. And it's also an invitation to engage the imagination in a theological response. Because if you look at transhumanist visions of the future, they're nothing if not imaginative. And I think that says something about their appeal and also about the type of response they call forth from a theological perspective. So that's really my starting point. So far, I've focused on understanding human technological enhancement in order to then think theologically about how we might engage it. And acknowledging that transhumanism and human technological enhancement are driven by a number of commitments that go beyond the strictly scientific, I want to shift gears now and look at some particular theological perspectives that might be able to help us frame a response from the perspective of a Christian faith. So firstly, I think there's a strong case to be made that God partners with us in some fashion when it comes to the work of ongoing creation. And a number of theologians make this case with respect to artistry in particular. Theologian Trevor Hart, for example, traces the development of the language that we use for creativity from scripture throughout subsequent history. Uh, and finally, he concludes that at various key points in the story of God's creative fashioning of a world fit for his own indwelling with us, divine artistry actively solicits a corresponding creaturely creativity, apart from which the project cannot and will not come to fruition. And in making this claim, Hart's drawing on support from the work of many other theologians and biblical scholars. But he does take pain to orient the sense in which we might think of human artistry as genuine creativity in an earlier understanding of what artistry involves. So actually, I think the term craftsmanship, as we understand it now, is probably more helpful. So God is the master craftsman, with humans analogous to the apprentice in the master's workshop. And in such an analogy, we have certain established limits and boundaries. There are considerations of authority and obedience to be observed. There are traditional ways of working with which faith must be kept. There are accepted standards of excellence which are to be acknowledged and pursued. But within this context, there's genuine freedom and ingenuity which can operate, which is nurtured and schooled within the master's domain. And as with most theologians who kind of look at human creativity, Hart is really focused on the arts. Uh, but actually, I think it seems applicable to all kinds of human making. And if we look back through history, there hasn't been quite the chasm between art and technology that we see today. So humans have always been technological uh, in the sense that we've always kind of used tools and manipulated the environment around us to kind of improve our circumstances. 
Uh, so perhaps technology is also a legitimate outlet of human creativity. On the more scientific side of things, uh, theologian Philip Hefner engages with biocultural and evolutionary science in his own proposal, uh, contending that human beings are God's created co-creators, whose purpose is to be the agency acting in freedom to birth the future that is most wholesome for the nature that has birthed us, the nature that, that is not only our own genetic heritage, but also the entire human community, and the evolutionary and ecological reality in which and to which we belong. Okay, so that's all well and good, you might say. As humans, we're given stewardship, perhaps even dominion over the rest of creation, and maybe we can use technology in those spaces. But human technological enhancement is different, maybe. Human nature itself is maybe strictly off limits. Well, Anglican priest and psychologist Jonathan Jong convincingly demolishes that line of argument, I think. He considers all the ways in which aspects of human nature, so things like cognition, longevity, even height, have shifted over time and points out that biology doesn't actually offer a clear delineation of what it means to be human. He writes that before we can determine the traits that are natural to humans, such that attempting to modify them is a violation of human nature, we need some account of what a human is, whose nature it is we are investigating. There seem to be two strategies taken, to delegate the definitional responsibility to biologists and accept that human beings are whatever homo sapiens are, or to assert that natures are self-evident and that we recognize it when we see it, even if we cannot list necessary and sufficient criteria. And I think we often conflate the theological significance of human being with biological markers, but actually altering our genes or our physiology doesn't automatically constitute a, a theological reclassification in what we are. I do want to talk just briefly about the image of God, the Imago Dei, uh, because it's often brought into theological reflection on human enhancement. So in the context of artificial intelligence, Noreen Hertzfeld describes the image of God as a litmus test for humanity. For Hertzfeld, the Imago Dei is universal to human being. It provides a foundation for human uniqueness and also underpins the moral status of humans. And Hefner, who I just mentioned, also sees a functional understanding of the image of God as a key part of the human as a co-creator with God. To be create, created in the image of God implies that humans can be the vehicle for grace towards the creation in a way that is somehow reminiscent of God's graciousness. So certainly the doctrine of the image of God is very present in theological understandings of the human that give room for technology in shaping what we're becoming. And I definitely don't want to overlook that. But the main reason why I don't personally draw on the idea of the image of God too much uh, in this is because I agree with Janine Thwaitebate's assessment that despite its important and importance and centrality, the biblical concept of the Imago Dei remains ambiguous, prompting a long history of theological interpretation of this primary and yet stubbornly mysterious aspect of human being. So essentially, I don't think the scriptural references to the image of God give us enough concrete material to build a whole theological framework and, and understanding of what is a human on. It's a crucial theological commitment for sure. I don't want to discount that at all, but it's not very specific. And that makes for some pretty wide ranging interpretations. If you've ever read kind of the, the vast theological work on the image of God, you'll see how diverse some of the proposals are. What I do think is really helpful in thinking about the image of God is to focus on the New Testament dimension of the Imago Dei that sets it in relationship to Christ. So we are told that Jesus is the image of God. So maybe this tells us something about human being. Here's Thweet Bates again. She says, in adding this Christological interpretation, humanity is linked to the divine image insofar as it resides in Christ who is the true image of God. 
This not only establishes Christ as a mediating figure between humanity and divinity, but introduces a progressive moral dimension to the image of God in that becoming Christ-like means perfecting the image of God within ourselves to better conformity with the true image revealed in Jesus Christ. So rather than get too deep into Christology, I just want to highlight a few of the implications for engaging with transhumanism. And firstly, Christ exemplifies what it means to be human. And theologians have historically, and unfortunately sometimes in the present, made the mistake of conflating this with the specifics of Christ's humanity, for example, his maleness. And the question of the normativity of Christ for humanity in tension with the particularities of his own embodiment is something that continues to to animate all kinds of theological discussion. But even as we ask, how might we discern the universals of human being through the particularities of Christ? It seems reasonable, I think, to say that specific physiological and genetic configurations are things that relate to the particularity of Christ, not to the universality. So Jesus being an exemplar isn't a prescription for human physiology and therefore doesn't encourage or prohibit biotechnological enhancement in or of itself. But more key, I think, is the way in which the incarnation reveals a union of divinity and humanity. And the boundaries for how this can be understood were drawn up uh, in the fifth century at the Council of Chalcedon, but the, t- the way in which the two natures come together in Christ precisely still remains foremost a mystery. But mystery notwithstanding, I think the incomprehensible truth of the word made flesh does tell us that technology cannot be the ultimate means by which our own humanity and telos can be fulfilled, even if technology can be deployed in ways that bring our social and our ecological context closer to that reality to that final hope. So here are some of the positions I've arrived at through firstly approaching proposals of technological enhancement in light of their underlying commitments, but then also looking for theological resources that might engage those kinds of questions productively. So humans are fundamentally creative. I think this is something that is core to us and technology is a legitimate exercise of that human creativity. And we're invited to partner with God in the work of ongoing creation. And many theologians would ground this in the understanding of humans as created in God's image. I think that's reasonable. Uh, And I also want to acknowledge that this does run counter to some theological perspectives that leave sort of little room for human freedom when it comes to understandings of creation and providence. So I'll acknowledge that. Uh, But I think that's a much bigger debate in theology that kind of goes beyond Uh, questions of technology and enhancement. But before we uh, veer too far in the direction of hubris, we remember that God is the ultimate agent in creation and redemption. And this is actually almost also really freeing. So we might have a task and a responsibility, but we don't shoulder the ultimate burden of making everything right by ourselves. Science informs an understanding of human being without defining or prescribing it. So this is the point that I made about how we define normative human nature. And simply put, biology can't do this definitional work when it comes to the essence of humanity and nor should it. The gene isn't some sacred and essential unit that we cannot interfere with, and all of the biological markers that we might draw on to define human being are shifting goalposts. So we can't hang our theological understanding on them. But none of this means that theologians or Christians are called to embrace transhumanism or technology wholesale. What this does is just transport the question of technological enhancement into the realm of ethics. So now, when we look at it that way, uh, discernment and wisdom is required around each separate proposal. So this is really my starting point for thinking about what it means to be human. And now what I want to do is turn to how we think about the human future. Uh, So what what is the picture of hope that we're operating with? 
Uh, and in turning from here to consider potential human futures, we're really thinking about the relationship between, in, in theological terms, this area called theological anthropology, so the study of like what is a human, what does it mean to be human, uh, and eschatology, so questions of ultimate purpose and meaning and kind of end times theology. So how does our understanding of what it means to be human, so our created purpose, the impact of sin, things like that, shape our understanding of God's end game? Take, for example, the question of creation and teleology. So there are all kinds of historic and symbolic kind of layers that complicate the question, but do we generally understand the original creation to be good in, se in the sense of a static purpose? Or was creation always intended to grow dynamically towards some end, for example, union with God? And where you land on this will have obvious implications for how you conceive of other doctrines like sin and incarnation. <coughs> and of course, the second understanding that the perfection of creation includes growth is going to be more open to the possibility of technological enhancement. And we do see this strand present in the Christian tradition particularly in the patristics, the church fathers, and most strongly in accounts of what is called theosis. So Irenaeus is referred to a lot to articulate this understanding, as are some of the Eastern church fathers, like Gregory of Nyssa. But I'm going to turn to contemporary theologian Catherine Tanner, who draws on these understandings in her own account of human nature as malleable to transformation. She writes that human beings must not only be changeable, but susceptible to radical transformation beyond the limits of their own or any created nature. Human beings through divine power become what they are not and have no capacity of being by themselves, human versions of the divine image itself. They therefore must have a created nature that does not put rigid bounds on what they can become. They must not be limited by their own nature in the way other things are, but must have the capacity in some strong sense to become other things. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that patristic thinkers like Irenaeus or Gregory of Nyssa had anything like biotechnological enhancement in mind. It's pretty fair to say that the types of growth they were envisaging and describing were more in the realm of spiritual and moral growth. So I'm certainly not drawing a straight line here, only to say that an understanding of creation with a telos, with a dynamic purpose, rather than a static perfection, is more compatible with the idea that technology can shape human becoming. On the flip side of these growth eschatologies is a version of Christian hope that looks back to Eden, looking to recapture that original state of perfection. And often, I think we see neg particularly negative responses to technology set it up in opposition to pure or unspoiled nature. There's this kind of oversimplistic rationale operating, I think, that if something is natural, then it's good, and if it's artificial, then it must be bad. And I'm not at all saying that we shouldn't value nature and seek to preserve it, but just that there's almost a fetish, fetish that's a really hard word, fetishization at work in some places. Uh, Bronislav Zizinski traces this tendency and subsequent view of nature, writing that from the late 18th century, nature started to be seen in various ways as the unspoiled, as an Edenic arena of goodness and innocence, unsullied by the artifice, alienation and corruption of modern life, nature came to take on new sacral meanings as a counterpoint to the increased technologization of society. And if we turn particularly to the human condition and we start to identify an underlying nostalgia for the innocence of Eden, that's pretty troubling, I think, because it tells a story of human identity original innocence that doesn't map very well onto the insights that we gain from evolutionary science. It strips us of our agency in our own formation. And it can also draw up some boundaries around what is normative for human nature that I think we should be wary of. Apart from the telos or the purpose of creation, 
When it comes to eschatology, we also need to think about how we conceive of the future in relation to the present. And the German theologian Jürgen Moltmann first drew attention to the differing ways that we can conceive of the future. And there's a language distinction in German that's obscured in English. So he uses the German words for this. He talks about the first kind of future, futurum, as a future that's continuous with the present. Whereas we have an Adventist future, which emphasizes discontinuity. So this is a future that arises from beyond time and space in fulfillment of divine promise. And you see the root of the, the term Advent there. Uh, Michael Burdett clarifies the distinction by showing how the future and sense of the future is driven by what is behind, whereas an Adventist future is driven by what is ahead, what is yet to come. And accounts of the future, all accounts of the future, including technological ones, can emphasize one or the other or combine these elements. For example, we might look to the work of Francis Bacon, the father of modern science, and one of the significant figures in a genealogy of transhumanist his, uh, philosophy. So Bacon really represents the dominion narrative or the progress myth, if you will, uh, which kind of united the idea of humans as masters of nature with the promise of modern empirical science. And in his work, The Great Instauration, which refers to a restoration, he argues that man, by the fall, fell at the same time from his state of innocency and from his dominion over creation. Both of these losses can in this life be in some part repaired, the former by religion and faith, the latter by arts and sciences. Historian of science and religion Peter Harrison draws out the different remedies for the losses that Bacon identifies. So Bacon recounts two distinct ways in which there might be a restoration of what was lost at the fall. While the loss of innocence could be restored only by grace, human dominion, made possible by atomic knowledge, was not a supernatural gift but a natural capacity. And Burdett sets these remedies in their eschatological perspective. So he lines Bacon's idea of religious transformation with an Adventist future, but then the contribution of human effort in recovering dominion through science and technology introduces a future element into that future. So how does a transhumanist eschatology or vision of the future compare? Well, Burdett also draws out the religious dimensions, highlighting certain elements that are central to the transhumanist vision. So firstly, technology promises the cessation of death and the end of suffering. And there's this idea that we'll be able to transcend our present limitations to achieve a physical and internal state of bliss. And the way that this state of bliss is conceived of, Burdett suggests that it can be likened to a religious notion of glorification. And former evangelical Christian Megan O'Gleveland lends weight to the understanding of transhumanism as a religious substitute. So she talks about her own disillusionment with Christian faith and her discovery of transhumanist philosophy as a satisfying alternative. She writes that transhumanism offered a vision of redemption without the thorny problems of divine justice. It was an evolutionary approach to eschatology, one in which humanity took it upon itself to bring about the final glorification of the body and could not be blamed if the path to redemption was messy or inefficient. But it's clear from her description that transhumanism is firmly in the futurism category when it comes to how it conceives of the future. And it's even lost that Adventist component that earlier humanists like Bacon included. Although I do think in some respects that the idea of a technological singularity functions as a pseudo-Adventist event or element of transhumanist futures. So instead of God breaking in to transform and to do something new, the technology of our own creation will accomplish something beyond our ability to predict or conceive of now. So again, some of these parallels, I think, provide Christians with an opportunity 
to engage in a dialogue with proponents of these techno, techno futures that can give us greater understanding. And again, it's another invitation to engage our imaginations in the way that we respond in faith. Because here, I think the Christian hope may expose these enhancement proposals not as unreasonable or as nonsensical or even hubristic. You know, even if these are true adjectives, they hardly lend themselves to constructive dialogue. But I think they can expose these visions as insufficiently imaginative or ambitious by comparison. Theologians Richard Balcom and Trevor Hart contrast Christian eschatology with progress myths, and they argue that Christian hope is neither Promethean nor quietist. It neither attempts what can only come from God nor neglects what is humanly possible. So I think the genuine Adventists of a Christian eschatology can be held up as a response to the counterfeit Adventists represented in a technological singularity. And Moltmann puts forward a convincing argument for understanding Christian eschatology as neither within nor outside of time, but rather a transformation of time. With the coming of God's glory, future time ends and eternal time begins. And if you read his kind of all the stuff he writes about time, it's a bit mind bendy and possibly there are physicists here who will understand them much better than I do. But essentially we aren't transported to a different realm to experience the fulfillment of Christian hope, but it's not something that just comes to us passively with time either. So this Adventist of Christian hope sits in stark contrast to the futurum that's imagined by technological futurists. So Christian theology has a positive story to offer in the context of human enhancement without necessarily denying a role for technology uh, in any way, a theological perspective can identify and resist new forms of Gnosticism, this idea that there's the secret knowledge that will save us. That's, of course, if we're operating with a good eschatology. So theologian N.T. Wright is one of those who calls out the lingering influence of Gnosticism, which has led some to this, this version of, of hope that, that kind of pictures souls in transit, uh, where Christians hope to leave behind fallen material existence altogether for eternity in spirit form. But neither do we want to veer towards the other extreme. So the trenchant progress myth, which considers history marching inevitably towards a liberal democratic utopia through evolution, science, technology, and enlightened thought, has influenced some Christian visions of the future in a similar direction as the natural outcome of evolutionary optimism. Whereas the affirmation of the material creation as good celebrates embodiment and thus envisions a future that is far more audacious than mere software immortality. And in this recognition of the body, theology is actually very much on the same side of science. So the fields of embodied cognition, the psychological study of emotion, even the science of metaphor and language are all converging on the significance of the body. And I heard some parallel sessions yesterday that were really talking about the mind-body connection in very encouraging ways. Christina Bieber Lake sums up the pseudo nature of the type of transcendence imagined by transhumanism. To define transcendence as the inevitable outcome of technologically driven human evolution represents not only a phenomenon unique to the 20th and 21st centuries, but also a rejection of thousands of years of philosophical and theological thinking about what constitutes the highest and best life available to human beings. So given the conference theme, I just want to finish with a few comments reflecting as a theologian on the type of theology that I think will help us continue to engage scientific and technological ideas from faith perspectives into the future. Firstly, theology engaging some of these emerging questions will be stronger if it's collaborative and interdisciplinary. And as most of you are scientists, you know this already, and you tend to be much better at collaboration than theologians usually are. So we can learn from you there. But one of the most rigorous and interesting collaborative projects I was part of involved bringing theologians from a range of Christian traditions together with scientists for a workshop on biotechnological enhancement. 
and we spent time sort of listening to scientific perspectives on particular technologies and proposals uh, before offering contextual responses from theology. So we did publish a separate issue in Theology and Science that focused on the scientists' contributions, but these articles here in Studies in Christian Ethics mostly come from theologians who hadn't encountered a lot of those questions before listening to the actual scientists who are working in these kinds of fields. When I was first studying theology and starting to think about whether I could do theology for a living, I remember being frustrated by the label of feminist theology. So would people assume that I was doing feminist theology? I just want to do theology, I used to proclaim to just about anyone who would listen. Good theology that just happens to be written by a woman. And so my first mistake was firstly thinking that feminist theology is only concerned with narrow subjects of gender and sexism rather than just being theology that pays attention to the gender of the person constructing it and, and the implications of the theology for, for questions of gender. So that was a little naive. But then my second mistake was thinking that my own gender or any other sort of key characteristic part of me could be incidental to my theology in any way. But that question of what does it mean to just do theology when the way we do theology is so inescapably contextual? Because we still tend to reserve the term contextual theology for theology that's done from marginal perspectives. You know, kind of like the way you know, we hear accents in other people's voices, but not our own. So there's mainstream historical theology and then there's contextual theology. And the poverty of that kind of thinking is shown up, I think, in theological engagements around te technological enhancement. Because who decides what it means to be human? Historically, many have been excluded from this category, women, non-white people, queer folks. And it's not surprising to me that the sharpest critiques uh, and the most promising constructive proposals are usually coming from the margins. So disability studies, for example, offers a concrete engagement with varied embodiment and exposes underlying systems of exclusion and oppression. And certainly the disability community doesn't speak with one voice when it comes to enhancement. There are advocates as well as critics, but the perspectives do center inclusion and access in ways that confront many of those transhumanist references to the justice imperative behind enhancement. Afrofuturism is a movement that blends science fiction with African diaspora culture. Can a community whose past has been deliberately rubbed out and whose energies have been subsequently consumed by the search for legible traces of its history imagine possible futures, asks scholar of Afrofuturism Mark Derry. And if you read some of the movement's literature, you'll be able to judge for yourself. And more broadly, post-colonial studies show how non-Western approaches have often been able to resist sort of polarizing things like reason and imagination or mind and body uh, in ways that are really productive for current theological debates about what does it mean to be human. Transhumanism is often critiqued as overwhelmingly white and elitist. But the Chinese genre of immortality cultivation fiction represents a non-white iteration of transhumanism that looks to rebel against rather than to replicate sort of colonial depictions of the ideal human. So in contrast to most of the, the Western visions of technological immortality that I've focused on, the enhancement project that we see in, in these particular works uh, more often promotes cooperation rather than comp competition. And there's this real emphasis on the uh, imperative for those who are pursuing enhancement to care for the less powerful and the disenfranchised. And while sci-fi is often perceived uh, as offering a bleak, if not dystopic view of the future, there are plenty of subgenres that resist this tendency. So Becky Chambers, for example, writes what has been termed solar punk or hope punk. And she presents visions of the future that are thoroughly technological, but also kind and just. She explores questions of personhood and identity in relation to AI, considers how we find meaning in religion and ritual, 
and generally just inspires the reader to imagine a future in which technological enhancements aren't antithetical to equality and mercy. And it's worth reiterating, I think, how strongly the notion of embodiment comes through in many of these engagements from the margins. Again, not so surprising when it's often in bodily difference that these inequalities are grounded. And future theology will hopefully see engaging the imagination to be as important as engaging the intellect. Transhumanist visions of the future are compelling. Theological engagements, faith engagements, have to be creative if they're to come alongside that. So I've mentioned this a few times already, but I think it's a good place to land. And there's a bit of catching up to do when it comes to understanding how central the imagination is, at least in theology. But I think people are paying more attention to how appealing to the imagination shapes our hopes and our beliefs. For example, writing in Wired magazine, Michael Solana issues this clarion call to stop writing dystopian fiction because he thinks it's hurting the technological cause. So this tells us that fiction is influential in how people think about these emerging technologies and that technologists are recognising this fact. And of course, this is something that writers know already. And I've found science fiction to be a really helpful conversation partner in engaging these questions reflectively. And personally, I'm much better at reading and reflecting with fiction than writing it. But I do think there's a crucial place for Christians to actually be creating art. The interaction between theology and the arts is a whole field in itself. But into the future, I really hope that artistic work will uh, receive more recognition as an actual mode of theology and not just the subject for theology to reflect on. So Ron Colturner is one of the first generation theologians who is engaging transhumanism and questions of technological enhancement. And I think he was way ahead of the field when he declared over 20 years ago that what we need today is a sustained effort at theological and poetic imagination that will yield texts and liturgies for the new age. We need visions and images that will sustain and restrain us as we define ourselves into the future. So the possibility of radically enhancing human capacities through technology is alarming for many Christians, for many people, actually. But through brief engagements in light of both theological anthropology and eschatology, I've wanted to show that while some versions of the future envisioned by transhumanists do warrant critique, the idea of using enhancement technologies to alter human being and living isn't inherently wrong and doesn't always run counter to a theological understanding of what it means to be human or to a Christian hope in what we're becoming. If we understand technology as a fundamental element of the cre creativity gifted us by our creator God, and we understand the eschatological future as one that's both related to the present world, thus calling for our participation in bringing it about, yet ultimately constituted by the inbreaking of God from outside time and space, then technological enhancement offers, uh, occupies its rightful place. It's something that requires the graces of wisdom and discernment rather than outright prohibition. And finally, we're not only technological, but imaginative creatures. And I think this recommends a particular mode of dialogue with these future possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, for an excellent uh, presentation on issues of great relevance to the future of science and faith, as well as uh, regardless of what field we're in. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just wanted, uh, wanted to get your feedback on the Christian Transhumanist Association. So there actually is a Christian Transhumanist Association. And, um, you know, one of their sort of uh, doctrines is that through technological enhancement and through 
Christian religion, we're going to become more human is sort of what they say. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me Christian transhumanism is sort of an oxymoron. And I just wonder what, what your thoughts are about this. It, uh, it, it's, um, it's an interesting movement, yep. but to me, it strikes me as a kind of syncretism, right? <laughs> kind of taking a technological utopian kind of technicism and kind of mashing it up with Christian thinking and kind of trying to, mm. but I, I wonder what you think about them. And there's a lot of Mormons apparently involved yeah. in that movement as well. Yeah, I mean, actually, I fairly recently declined an invitation to join the Christian Transhumanist Association. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, if, if you actually look at their mission statements and everything else, um, I, I actually want to say they're not really transhumanists. <laughs> um, they're Christians who are techno-optimists, you know, technophiles, um, and, and that that's as I've tried to explain today, I don't see that as something that's necessarily an antithetical to Christian faith. Um, so I feel like they're co-opting a label that doesn't necessarily need to be there to articulate a generous Orthodox Christian understanding that also leaves room for the kinds of things we do uh, using science and technology to improve our world. I, I very much accept your idea that Jesus is an exemplar of the image of God. Mm. However, um, as a parent, I, I have a problem when reading the scriptures that Jesus never was a parent. So my question is, um, would you accept uh, 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 Dan Brown's suggestion in the Da Vinci Code that uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a child and would that maybe add an image, uh, wouldn't that increase our image of God as, a, as Jesus as a parent? Do you know, I think you've just provided a perfect example of trying to wrestle with how do we understand Jesus as exemplar for humanity uh, when he cannot manifest every particularity of what it means to be human. So there have to be things that we look to Jesus and say, they say something about universal human experience but he's not going to meet every particular. And if we start to look at things that are very particular to him, which might be his gender, his time in history, his um, ethnicity, you know, all kinds of things, uh, and, and start to look to those as definitive of what it means to be human, then we run into trouble. So I, I don't think we need him to check off every uh, unique human experience to be able to say something about universal human being. Yeah. Does the uh, work of uh, Teilhard de Chardin figure into your uh, analysis? Yeah, a little bit. So Teilhard Chardin was a Jesuit theologian who had a very sort of evolutionary perspective on, on how God works in the world. Um, he possibly veers too far in the direction of process theology in, in some respects for me, but I think he's... Um, the capaciousness of his vision of, of human becoming and the, the freedom within what God is doing in the world um, is inspiring. And, and certainly there is um, a lot in his work that um, I can celebrate in terms of kind of giving space to the kinds of, kinds of things we do with the imagination and the, the ingenuity that we've been gifted with. Yep. So uh, thanks so much for the presentation, because as an inventor and a technologist, I find it very, very humbling, and I'll tell you why. Um, like if you look at how the internet was birthed, or if you look at how Facebook was birthed, uh, you know, like if you look at Facebook, initially look at it, it was a very simple dyadic graph that any first year computer science student would learn, and then the application of it created where we are today. And so my point then is that as an inventor, as a technologist, uh, Christians or not, we create because we can. And we never thought, give any thought at all to the implication of what it means to be human. And if you think of people like Mark Zuckerberg and all these other people, initially, I don't, I do believe initially nobody really intend any harm. It's just because it's fun to apply a graph application that way. So my um, question then is that I think we need, because of AI, it push us 
to really need to think about what we are doing. And uh, whether it is Christian or non-Christian, I think the technologists need, uh, in the industry who create things and put in people's hand, uh -huh. uh, it would find it very refreshing to find a forum yeah. to integrate uh, the thought of what we are planning to invent and the implication of it from uh, what you understand as a human point of view. So that's, that's number one, that forum never existed. Number two, for Christian, uh, yesterday I talked about, this is our Esther moment. Mm -hmm. And let's say Christian technologists and inventor got that this is our Esther moment. We still have this big question mark as to, so what do we need to create in the work of our hands so that it would be more aligned with the heart of God than rather just because we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I really appreciated about your presentation was there was a lot of um, disenchantment of what artificial intelligence is, like, you know, and, and that kind of becoming informed with what the technology actually is and what its limitations is, is I think part of the calling, not just for, for people who are Christians working in the sciences and technology, but for Christians who are using them too. So I, I didn't speak much about AI because I knew we had a whole session from you on that, but you know, I see these responses kind of very much focusing on the biggest existential questions of will AI become conscious? Will it be a person? Will it kind of take over the world? Um, and, and they kind of veer from this extreme anxiety to almost extreme awe. So the musician Nick Cave describes people as buzzing with algorithmic awe, and I really like that expression. <laughs> He's great with words. Um, but actually both of those responses kind of distract us from the present reality, which is that it's a very human, you know, it's human all the way down. It's developed by humans, trained on humans, on data, you know, produced by humans, used by humans toward very human ends. And there are all kinds of ethical and justice questions in that human domain. And that's where, you know, if you want to talk about an Esther moment, I think that's where Christians can be advocating for the just use of technologies that exist now, um, not just speculating about kind of existential questions, which are important, um, you know, don't want to dismiss them, but not if they distract us away from what is happening now and where the injustices are. Okay, we started a bit late, so we'll go a few minutes late. Um, three more quick questions, two over here and one over there. Thanks for a very helpful presentation. In, in what ways does the hope of resurrection inform this conversation from a Christian perspective? Yeah, so I mean, that was in there in the sense that um, if, if we talk about a, a Christian hope of bodily resurrection, as I said, that's far more audacious than this idea of living um, immortally just through software. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, it, as an imaginative and compelling vision of hope, it, it blows away any kind of transhumanist proposal. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Al Alistair is also my supervisor, so it's great to- Congrats. Um, yeah, so my question, uh, I, I did notice on one of the sources was Eastern Orthodoxy, um, when it comes to essentially the sociological mm -hmm. traditions, law of God, manhood, and stuff like that. I'm curious, what sort of resources do you think we can draw from our Easter brothers and sisters? Yeah, I think um, what I find the most helpful uh, is looking to understandings of, of the original creation in terms of there's always this growth trajectory that... So, so if we think about what is perfection, um, you know, take for example a newborn, like no one says a baby is not perfect, but if they were still the same sort of 30 years later, then you know, we might have concerns. So you know, they're built to grow into themselves and to change and to become. And, and um, perfect doesn't have to mean static. So I think the emphasis on sort of, um, the way that God draws us in to greater union with God's self in the Eastern tradition is, is a helpful framing for thinking about sort of human growth and the role of human activity towards that kind of hope. Last question. Oh, sorry, from my side? Oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> yes. yes. 
Thank you for your, um, for your presentation. Um, my question is, you, you made reference to Eden and that there are some features from Eden which might not be very helpful to think about um, because they're kind of incongruent with um, evolution or mm -hmm. ideas from evolution. Uh, so how does that square with the new Jerusalem? Because in Revelation 21 and 22, mm -hmm. it described in Edenic terms. Mm. similar to um, the temple also built the, the descriptions of the Holy of Holies in sort of Edenic, in, in, in Edenic terms. So should we also be wary of those features in the New Jerusalem? And probably what are some of those features we should be concerned, we should be concerned about? Oh, that's a great question. I think it depends on how you approach it. And if we look at the symbolism, certainly there are parallels, but there are also differences. And the New Jerusalem is not just a garden, it is a city. And there is, um, if you will, there is technology. Um, I, I'm not saying technology will get us there, but just that um, Eden functions as a starting point of human in innocence and of, of, of God's creation. Um, and we, you know, certainly sin kind of knocks us off course from this trajectory that we're intended for. Um, but I want to argue that there was always this intended kind of growth and, uh, you know, being drawn closer to God even than, than the symbolism of, of being with God in the garden. So I would say the New Jerusalem has parallels, but it is not a return to Eden. It's um, an even a larger kind of more... Um, glorious kind of union with God. Thank you once again. Mm -hmm.